you take your Bibles this morning, please, and open them to the book of First Thessalonians once again, we, are, we find ourselves, you know, continuing in chapter 2 this Lord's Day. And Paul begins this particular session after covering the first six verses. Yes, we do. I'm sorry. Thank you. I forgot. We have junior church available, so take advantage of that. Um, but the uh, Paul has uh, related to the uh, Thessalonican church uh, some of his heart, and certainly there is a very distinctive heart tone to the book of First Thessalonians that you don't get in some of the others. Primarily, that's because First Thessalonians is not a corrective epistle, uh, and meaning that Paul was not writing to address a bunch of problems and issues that that particular fellowship uh, could have been having. Uh, the best example of a corrective epistle is probably 1 Corinthians. Galatians also fits in there. Uh, Paul, even Colossians, uh, have dealing with the Gnostic heresy of elitism, you know, and academic, uh, you know, superiority and stuff. Uh, various things, you know, kind of fits into that category, at least in some fashion. Thessalonians doesn't have, Thessalonians is informative. It covers certain things, such as the rapture of the church in, in chapter 4, very significantly. Deals with prophetic issues and lifestyle things uh, and good choices as far as the sanctification and, and things like that. But it's done from a perspective of exhortation and encouragement, not you messed up and now I've got to tell you how to fix it uh, approach, okay? Uh, so there is a distinctly different tone uh, to much of this as well. Uh, Paul has related to us in the first six verses of chapter 2, after giving them the, uh, the you know, I guess, kind of the theme verse in some ways of chapter 1, verse 3, work of faith, labor of love, and endurance of hope, uh, in the first six verses of chapter 2, he introduces uh, a very much of a heart attitude, but he starts with the absolutely essential platform of preaching the gospel of witnessing and testifying of the gospel message of Christ. Uh, the, uh, he speaks of this uh, in verse 4 and says that we have been entrusted with the gospel. Uh, God has given to believers, all believers, you and I, if we're here this morning and we're believers, fall right into the application of this. Obviously, in the context, he's talking about the apostolic truth uh, of the revealing of the doctrine of the gospel message of Christ. And here, he's laying it out very clearly that we, believers, have been entrusted. We have been granted the privilege and responsibility of the most important message that God has ever provided for mankind to receive. It's just that simple. And he says, this is what we need then in our own opportunities to present to our fellow man as well. <clears throat> so he is making every one of us a missionary. Everyone who is a believer then has a missions responsibility. As our scripture reading last week pointed out to us in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1, Therefore, having received this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. Okay? Uh, we have received the mercy of God when we put our faith and trust in him and were saved. Okay? Uh, since we have received that mercy, we now have a ministry. They come together. They are not something separate. Now, we can do a good job of ministering, a mediocre job, a poor job, a selfish job, a non-existent job, you know, however you want to phrase it, but the reality is that we have a ministry, and that's the way it's phrased. We have this ministry, and the keynote aspect of that particular verse is we faint not. Okay? We, we're not quitters. Times get tough, circumstances are difficult, finances go into the toilet, whatever it happens to be, you know, we're not going to quit. We're going to keep on keeping on. 
uh, because we have a ministry. God's mercy never departs. Our ministry never departs. Okay, that's the idea as well. Paul here writes uh, the the concept of this presentation of this gospel message as he brought to the church at Thessalonica, and he brought to them the reality uh, that there were certain parameters that were necessary for a biblical presentation of the gospel. Just as a reminder, verse 3, non-deceitful, not of uncleanness, not talking about physical, he's talking about spiritual contamination. There's no guile. Verse 5, it says, we didn't use flattering words. There was no cloak of covetousness. He wasn't trying to get anything uh, in return. Uh, we weren't seeking men's glory, and we refused to be burdensome. Uh, these things are projected as being wrapped around verse 4, being entrusted with the gospel message. In other words, if we fail to analyze and incorporate the what God wants us to do and how he wants us to do it, we are in danger of hindering the effectiveness of our gospel presentation our testimony is going to suffer. Uh, and God will not get the glory he deserves. Now, does that mean that somebody is not going to get saved that God has elected from before the foundation of the world? Not at all. Not at all. But you are going to lose all the blessing. Okay? Yeah. You are going to lose the blessing. And that can even damage the testimony of other Christians or local church that we attend, you know, or the cause of Christ within our community, uh, the ripple effect is certainly very real. So we need to be very cautious about how we put this gospel presentation into place because there's a right way to do it, and sadly, there's not so right way of doing it, okay? So there's some guidelines here for us. Uh, Paul now shifts, and I want to make, make the point here uh, that accurate biblical doctrine is so necessary to the local church that it's not just important, it's not just vital, it's essential. You build on a poor foundation, you wind up with a very shaky structure. Uh, you really do. Uh, it's essential. Christ is the center of Christianity. What we learn from Christ does not come from our emotions or our experiences. It comes directly from the Bible itself. That's why the Bereans, that passage we referred to, Acts 16 and 17, as the historical background for Thessalonica. Okay? Why they, Paul said the Bereans were more noble than those in Thessalonica because they searched the scriptures daily to see, was Paul's preaching accurate? Was it in line with what the Old Testament taught about the coming of the Messiah? Okay. And they checked him out. You know, ah, did, you know, he had bona fides. He could have whipped out his bona fide apostle card and flashed it back and forth in front of people. He could have talked about you know, being tutored by Gamaliel. You know, the, the prima donna of that time and place in the world as far as a personal philosophical tutor. Uh, he could have talked about being a Pharisee of the Pharisees, a member of the Sanhedrin, you know, and all caught personally saved by Jesus on the road to Damascus. Wow! I mean, you know what he did? He said, I'm chief amongst sinners. He said, you need to know the gospel that saved a sinner like me. Yeah. And what is the gospel? Well, one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. You know, Paul didn't see himself as superior. He saw himself as a servant of the Most High God. Okay. And he wasn't going to compromise the integrity of biblical doctrine, especially concerning the cause of Christ and the gospel, you know, just to get the accolades of men or to get a pat on the back or to make more money or whatever else it could have done. He wasn't there to argue anybody into Christianity because next week somebody who's a better arguer could come by and argue them right back out. Okay? It's not about 
that. It's about a faith transaction between God and the heart of the sinner. So he brings this up as he kind of changes gears. Look at verses 7 and 8. Let me read them for our consideration. But, he says, uh, he's, he's always transitioning a thought here. We were gentle among you as a nurse cherishes her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted to you not just the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, lives, because you were dear to us. Okay? Now, the term nurse here uh, is nursing mother. Okay? It's a woman who is nursing an infant. Uh, this is a, he's talking about having a gentle, cherishing heart. Just as a uh, woman will, <laughs> I was going to use the word cuddle. Can I say cuddle? Uh, you know, an intimate, familial type term, you know, where a woman takes an infant and cuddles it to her breast in order to provide the nutrients and the sustenance that that baby needs to grow on. Okay? Uh, you know, we often heard here of the bonding experience of mother and nursing child. That's the type of thing that Paul is speaking of here, a bonding experience. The word gentle means mild or kind, and the King James phrase, one word in the Greek, affectionately desirous, means to yearn for. To be, I mean, it, you know, to have a, it, it's a passion word, you know, to be yearning. He deals with the aspect of being, wish, wanting to impart uh, there. He says, I wanted, in verse 8, I wanted to impart to you. He said, the gospel, yes, that's the foundation. He says, that's absolutely vital, essential, necessary. But he said, I wanted to go beyond that. Uh, he said, I wanted to share with you things that go beyond just the gospel message. Because, you see, we're human beings as members of a local church, and we need uh, to have not just the right hand of fellowship and donuts, uh, we need to have a bonding. We need to have the yearn to meet the needs of other people, to share. Romans 1, verses 11 and 12, Paul writes this in his introduction to the, the church at Rome. I long to see you so that I can impart, the word means share, so I can, I can share with you some spiritual gifting to the end that you may be firmly established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. He said, we have the common bond of Christian faith. And he said, I wanted to take the opportunity to come together to be with you so that I could exercise the spiritual gifts that God has given me so that you would benefit from it. Now, obviously, he was a preacher, a teacher, and a church planner. But can't you see the application? No. We may have different giftings. We all do. The packaging that God provides. Uh, our responsibility then should be like Paul indicates here. We, we need to be exercising those. You know? how, can, how, how can what I do benefit somebody else in the congregation? You know? A word of encouragement, a kind thing, a, a consideration being praying for one another, encouraging, uh, just go through the New Testament, just punch in your search thing on your smartphone that you're dealing with, uh, and look up the one another's. Makes a great Bible study, it really does. All the different things, you know, that we are to be one anothering others about. Okay? Opportunities as God provides and everything that goes with it. Yes, the gospel was foundational absolutely essential but Paul goes beyond that he's saying that there needs here to be a commitment he said I had an intimate relationship with you believers in Thessalonica he had planted that church there you know whether it was three weeks or three months we have no idea for certain but a fairly short period of time and the church when he wrote this letter back to them from Athens had only been in existence for a year and they were already, according to chapter 1, a testimony to everybody in the entire region of how they were 
Christian in their actions and their doctrine. And a lot of that has to do with how they treat one another. It really does. He says, you were dear to me. You were beloved. You know, he said, they preferred one another. Uh, that's the idea here. We were affectionately desirous. He said, he said, your life, your soul, your well-being meant more to me than my own, is the idea. Preferring one another. It might kind of takes on a different meaning that way, because you and I have been essentially raised uh, to be selfish. Our old nature is extremely selfish. That part that we fight with all the time that seems to be so anti-God in so many ways. And uh, what we uh, take a look at here uh, is we, we need to get beyond the selfish part of it. Uh, because we often see that the world teaches us this all right from the get-go. Okay, look out for number one. What's in it for me? How do I come out ahead? Is my slice of the pie bigger than anybody else's? How can I make more money? How can I gather more fame? How can I build bigger, have more, run faster, jump higher? You know, it's all about me, 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 and it's all selfish, selfish, selfish. Okay? Regardless of what the pop psychology of both the secular media and a lot of so-called evangelicalism tells you, America does not have a self-image problem, except for the fact that they are a bunch of bragging, self-centered whiners. Okay? Uh, we really are. A lot of us fit into that category, and even in the church, uh, a lot of us struggle with that very issue. Okay? Paul says, no, we need to be careful and we need to be reaching out to minister one to another because we should be dear to each other, okay? Uh, you're beloved. Okay? Verses 9 and 10, he gives a personal example. He says, you remember, brethren, uh, that's a very common word in a lot of scripture, by the way. It says you should be remembering this at least. It, it's almost one of those, yeah, I'm not going to say you are forgetful, but I'm going to remind you to your need to remember so you won't be forgetful even when you are forgetful, but I'm not going to remind you that you are. Yeah? And by that time, people have got the idea, maybe I should remember this. Okay, that's it. You remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day because we would not be chargeable to any of you. We preach to you the gospel of God. You are our witnesses, God, also how holily, justly, and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. You remember. He said, well, you've got an established track record. Think back to how, how I conducted myself when I was there planting the Thessalonican church. Uh, labor means pain or weariness. Travail means toil with sadness. Laboring means hardship. Those are the literal renderings of the Greek words that are used here. Uh, this is not tiptoeing through the tulips, okay? This is not marshmallows floating on top of your hot chocolate. You know, having a grand time. I'm not a, 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 anti any of that, but when it comes to Christian ministry, it's all not about, hey, you know, I need to feel good. I need to be comfortable. I need to, you know, have a good self-image. I need, You don't need any of that. That's not what the Bible is teaching here. Paul talks about labor and travail. Uh, to the extent, he says, it's only night and day. You know, it's a, I know that the, one of the great, great gags in the pastor is we only work one hour a week, you know, type of thing. Uh, you know, I mean, most of us should chuckle at that. Uh, if you've ever done ministry, you realize that for every hour you're up front, there are many, many hours in preparation and in catch up after that fact as well. Uh, so it's uh, all this and more. He said, this is a constant thing. That's the idea, isn't it? He said, this is not just, I'm going to show up, 
you know, on Sunday and I'm going to preach a sermon and then the church will just somehow not only form by itself, but uh, you know, get along on its own, you know, do a grand job, have a wonderful testimony, and it'll all happen by osmosis. You know, we're not spreading the measles here. It doesn't work that way. Paul says this is a laborsome, this is a toilsome, this is painful at times. And it's got to go on constantly. And then he says, because. Did you see that in there? He says in, in uh, you know, where, middle of verse 9, because we would not be chargeable to any of you. Because. It's a purpose statement. Chargeable means to be heavy upon, to be expensive, to be costly to others. Okay? Uh, now, Paul is probably referring here to the fact that by trade, he was a tent maker. Okay. Uh, no, he didn't have a singer sewing machine. That's not the type that we're talking about. He made them out of canvas and hand stitched them with a big honking needle. Uh, Paul, but he's talking about being self-supporting. If you look back at verse 6, he says, we could have been burdensome. He said, we didn't even, he said, we didn't want to do that. In, in any fashion. And now he talks about this chargeable thing, uh, but he doesn't want to do that because some people might think, especially in first century where Christianity was brand new, where he's planting a church in a pagan environment, kind of like most places in America, uh, he said, I don't want to have my personal gain being a stumbling block. Uh, now, Paul could have and rightfully so, expected financial support from the Thessalonians. In fact, later on, you find that that is the case. They sent gifts to him for the support of his ministry. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17 puts it this way, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. The word means money. Okay? especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. That would be the preachers and teachers. For the scripture says you will not muzzle the ox that treads out the corn and, second quote, also from the Old Testament, the laborer is worthy of his reward. Now, this does not mean you support somebody uh, that is the tooth fairy. Okay? You support people who are laboring in the ministry who are meeting what he's talking about here, pain, weariness, toil, sadness, hardship, night and day. You know, not this, you know, download a sermon Saturday night and read it from the pulpit Sunday morning and then, you know, pick up your paycheck on the way out the door. That's not what Paul's talking about. Galatians 6, 6 emphasizes, let him that is taught in the word share with him that teaches in all good things. Yeah, the local congregation has the responsibility. But Paul here is talking about his planting of the Thessalonican church and that he valued the testimony in a pagan culture because there were all kinds of guys that were, you probably have a hard time relating to this, all kinds of guys that are out there with their hand out. Hmm? I don't care whether it's the street corners, you know, type of thing. And I love the guys that have the great big healthy dog, you know, that says, you know, it's a please give what you can. I'm hungry. And I just roll down the window and I just tell them, eat the dog. You know? I mean, if you're really hungry, don't, you know, I mean, get with the program. You know, type thing. It, it gets kind of mixed reactions, as you might expect from that. Uh, but, you know, it, it, there's always, there are moochers and panhandlers that are filling the pulpits of our land in front of the TV cameras, on tour, writing books, you know, and going to seminars as great speakers and everything else. You know, I'm not trying to knock any of those guys, but frankly, some of them, you know, need to work their way through this passage and find out that they're not laboring night and day. They're not, you know, planting churches. They're not working at it with their heart's desire, not at all. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, where do we go then from there? Well, 
It's a uh, note that it is the believer's testimony here. He says, uh, with this personal example, he says, you, verse 10, you are witnesses and God also, how holily, justly, and blamably, unblamably, we behaved ourselves among you that believe. Notice that Paul is concerned with the believer's testimony here. Now, he realizes that the unbelievers out there are probably not going to give him kind words. He's not really concerned about them. No, he's concerned about the testimony of and the relationship with the believers in Thessalonica. He uses words that we don't often use too much. Holy, well, I'll tell you what holy means. Holy means holy. Yeah, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to figure that out. Justly means to live equitably or righteously. Okay? It's, uh, in other words, you are a model citizen if from the secular point of view. Unblameably okay, does not mean sinless perfection. It means un being unchargeable. Uh, he, it means that Paul had a pattern of conduct in his life that when challenged, you know, nothing could be proven against him, that he was doing something that was unrighteous you know, uh, before God. Yeah, that's kind of a challenge, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, stop and think about it. How many of us would like to have your name at the top of the piece of paper you know, and just have, without you ever being able to see it, have it pass through the congregation and everybody writes down what you feel is a failure or a problem, a difficulty, a weakness in that person's life, in their testimony. Ouch! You know, some of us wouldn't fare so well, would we? You know? Now, being unchargeable means when that is examined, it doesn't, it has no validity. It's being arrested, you know, but when gone to court, there is no evidence to convict. That's the idea, you know, in a, you know, just in a broad sense of, of the terminology. And then he goes on in verses 11 and 12. He says, as you know, we exhorted, we comforted, and we charged every one of you as a father does his children. Now, you remember he started off there with the nursing mother and how precious that is, how intimate, you know, the bonding of a woman with a nursing infant, tenderness, compassion, that's kind of the picture that's being brushed onto the canvas of life there. And he's talking about the spiritual life. He's saying that that should be uh, there. But is that the complete picture? Because Paul now says fatherhood <laughs> has a contribution as well. What's he going to deal with? In order to have Christian leadership in a local church, it can't be just and this is what Paul's writing, the compassion, the tenderness, and the kindness, there also has to be, pardon the term, an iron grip. You know, dad's got to have the stick of discipline to remind the kids of what they're allowed and not allowed to do. Okay, let's see how that works out. The father role provides, and uh, uh, let me here suggest you disciple, you know, you do realize, don't you, that the term discipline comes from disciple? You know, a, if you use the noun, a disciple is a learner. He's a student. The disciples of Christ, they learn from Christ as he walked and taught and, and so forth, right? Okay. Uh, you know, if you use di uh, disciple, on the other hand, as a verb, it's the act of teaching act of training. Now, if you've ever potty trained a kid, you have discipled a child. 
if you've ever taught in a school or an education environment, you've discipled. That's what that is. It's a teaching process, a training process. Okay? Uh, that's what is being emphasized here. Discipline, as a derivative, if you want to call it that, is the same aspect. Okay? Uh, people are brought to a conformity, brought to a standard of conformity of what is being taught, what is being trained into. That's what he's talking about. Uh, so if you think disciple, you're pretty close when it comes to the role of father here. And he says that's exactly what is going on. He says, like a father does with his children. Three big words here. Ready? Exhortation, comfort, and accountability. Now, that's, you have charging, okay? That's the accountability word that I'm going to substitute if you want to look at it that way. Exhortation, the Greek word is parakaleo. It's the word we get used for paraclete, and you're going, so? And it says that's the word that is used for the Holy Spirit, okay? The paraclete, okay? The comforter, the counselor, the one who comes alongside. Uh, and it means to come alongside so that strength is shared in a partnership relationship. Okay. Uh, two examples that I, and I've used one of them a lot, and that is if you went back 150 years and you were an ivory hunter in Africa, uh, you would be out hunting elephants for, we call them teeth, they're not, the tusks. Okay. Uh, the weapons in those days were not nearly as powerful as we have today. It was very common with a heart shot elephant could run for two miles okay, uh, before he would collapse. Okay. It's also very common that the biggest tusks were the oldest bulls uh, and they would often have, they called them Ascari bulls, uh, Swahili term, uh, that were kind of the young guys that, you know, kind of hung around with the old guy to kind of learn all the techniques and kind of an interesting relationship there. You shoot the big guy through the heart, he takes off running and pretty soon he's leaked enough blood that he starts to get weak and he starts to kind of tilt over. Well, six to seven tons of elephant that's 12 to 13 feet tall at the shoulder, you know, you don't want them tilting just any place, do you, like in your flower bed or anything. So, you know, these companion bulls, the Ascari bulls, would literally, witnessed many, many times, come alongside. They could sense that the big old guy was getting weaker, and they would come alongside and actually sandwich him between them if there were two of them, you know, and hold him up so that he could continue to get away from the danger, you know, that they had encountered with the hunter. Okay. Obviously, it's, it's, it had cases where the bull literally died on his feet, still being held up by the young guys on each side. They were lending their strength in a team effort that they could get away from the danger in this particular case. I'll give you a, 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 a probably an easier illustration. If you have an urban fire, a house fire of some type, and a fireman goes in and carries somebody out that's been overcome by the smoke, that's pericoletal in action. That's being a paraclete. You are providing your strength because somebody else has lost theirs or is, in fact, losing theirs. Okay? Uh, that's what you're dealing with. It's interesting because the term comf comfort here, that second word, is also a Holy Spirit term. You remember what Jesus talked about at the Last Supper? I will send you another comforter. Yeah, he's going to... Send the Holy Spirit. That's another term, another phrase that is used, a label to identify the coming, in that case, of the Holy Spirit. Another comforter. Uh, he is going to encourage by consoling. That's the literal rendering. Uh, 
Uh, in other words, there's going to be difficult times for believers. And the Father's role is to, in those difficult times, to encourage by bringing consolation, bringing comfort, you know, to the need that's there. And then the term charge. Charge literally means provided direction. Okay? Uh, let's face it. Okay? If you're going to get on your horses and you're going to charge the enemy, you need to know which direction the enemy is. Otherwise, you, you know, you're not going to be that effective. You know? Uh, that, well, you know, it might be a bit tongue-in-cheek, but it's still accurate. You know, to be charged means to provide direction. Which way do we go? The path of righteousness is rather narrow. Uh, you know, we can get off of it real easy. A father's uh, responsibility here, you know, is to provide that direction. You know, it's interesting because the word itself is martyreo in the Greek. It's the word we get martyr from, okay? Uh, we are told that, you know, the, in Acts chapter 1, that you will be witnesses to me in you know, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Witnesses, same word, martyreo, martyros. It uh, depends upon, you know, which form it happens to be in. It's to witness, to testify, okay? But you've got to do that going in the right direction. Otherwise, it's a waste of time. If you're spending your best John 3.16 presentations in your bathroom while you're taking a shower, you are missing the point. You're not going in the right direction, okay? Nail it down. The Thessalonians, if you want to bring the idea here, were charged with testifying of the gospel which had been entrusted to them but directly by God himself. God's supernatural strength and the presence of the indwelling Holy Spirit was to uplift them as they went out in their community and testifying of the miraculous provision of God's gospel. That's the father part, isn't it? And of course there's a heavenly father that is part of that package as well. Verse 12 is this final part. He says, to walk worthy of the Lord. Okay. To walk worthy of the God who would saved them, who had delivered them from the wrath to come, referred to at the end of chapter 1, uh, to that the God who had entrusted them with the most precious message of mankind will ever hear, the gospel itself. Okay. Uh, they were to glorify God. God would be glorified when they took this message out and went from there. Okay. I just It's just only a couple of pages here if you go back to Colossians chapter 1 that Jack read to us as we close. He talks about here in this, this is a prayer that Paul gave uh, to for the, Thessal or the Colossian church. In verse 9, for this cause, we also, since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you. And what is our desire? That you would be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That's the study of scripture. That's the study of doctrinal truth. That's the gospel message as its foundation. Verse 10, so that you might walk worthy of the Lord in everything that is pleasing to him. That's the way it's phrased. Being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. Notice testimony and works and understanding sound doctrine and the teaching of the Bible is all integrated right there. That's what Paul, he said, this is what the worthy walk has as, as parts that fit together to make the whole. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. A reliance upon supernatural ability. That's what he's dealing with. For all word patience, endurance, long-suffering, and joyfulness, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us, King James' word is me, but has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life. God is the one ultimately that does the work and makes us worthy. But we are to walk worthy because he has made us partakers of the inheritance of eternity itself. 
He's delivered us from the power of darkness. We have redemption through his son. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. We do that. The worthy walk. The role of a blend. Father and mother characteristics. He's not talking about physical fathers and mothers. He's using that terminology as illustration. Okay? He said, this is what good parents provide if you want a good product to grow up and become an adult that came out of your loins. He said, this is what, these are the things that you need to, well, this spiritually, this is where we need to be focused. This is what we need to be doing. Okay? Amen. Uh, so you've got some real spiritual fantastic stuff that is available and here, now all we have to do Commit ourselves to it and go do it. Let's pray. Father, thank you as we bow before you. As your heart is to touch our hearts. Your desire is to touch our desires. Your direction is to cause us to go in the direction you choose. And we thank you for this education that we've looked at today. In Christ's name, amen.